be giving you a, a little talk about what we know about the, the technologies and how some of them are being used in the uh, biomedical application area. Uh, gels are really what represent the fourth state of matter. We're familiar with solids, liquids, and gases. Uh, gels occupy a space somewhere between solids and liquids in that they're typically a fixed volume and shape uh, under, under static conditions, but oftentimes they can be deformed readily under uh, stat, uh, agitation or other forces. They have both elastic properties and viscous properties, which can put them between solids and liquids. Uh, the microstructure of gels is what really gives them their unique properties. It's a two-phase uh, system composed of a solid phase, which is a network structure, and a liquid phase, uh, which is something that wants to dissolve the material. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, the, the liquid being water, that makes it a hydrogel rather than an organogel. And the water content with typical hydrogels can vary anywhere between 20 and 90 percent, very high contents. The water is trying to swell and dissolve the polymer network, and the physical crosslinks or chemical crosslinks connecting the network keep it from uh, dissolving and allowing it just to swell to a certain degree. And the sponge is the common analogy that folks will use for hydrogels. It's not a bad analogy, actually. The high water content of hydrogels is what really gives its uh, unique properties. The free water allows diffusions of solutes in and out, which is why it makes it very good for uh, drug release properties. The water also acts as a viscous, viscous damping effect. So rather than an elastomer, you have a viscous damping behavior, which is why it functions well as a cartilage type replacement. Also, the hydrogel content makes it very lubricious, depending on the type of material used. The network structure, this is the solids, is what really gives its, its, its rigid mechanical properties. Properties. And these crosslinks can either be permanent crosslinks or they can be ones that are labile, in other words, ones that respond to stress, disappear, and then come back. And uh, this is what provides it the elastic recovery behavior, more like elastomers. Hydrogels, I said, the analogy to a sponge isn't bad, except on uh, the, the pore structure on hydrogels is typically much smaller than you see on sponges. These are actually very large pores uh, that we can see here, ranging from uh, about 10 to 20 microns. Typical pores in, in, in uh, uh, hydrogels are nanometer in size, very small quantities. Uh, we can make hydrogels so that they're responsive to the environment that they get, they're put in, which is why they're great for biomedical application. They can respond to pH, temperature, ionic strength changes, pressure, electrical potential, and this is why when you put a hydrogel into solution or in, into the body, they'll either swell or deswell according to the local environment that's put in, which is great for drug release or mechanical response. And we can make these materials biodegradable as necessary, usually by including ester groups which result in hydrolysis and break up the material in a controlled fashion. The things that we know most, uh, that people are most familiar with hydrogels is their lubricious quality. The fact that they're composed mostly of water means that they can be made very slippery. Cartilage, again, is the thing we normally think about with hydrogels in the body. And uh, we can make materials that uh, have steric repulsion so that they, 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 that results in very lubricious quantities. So as engineers, we will manufacture and change the microstructure of hydrogels to tune in particular properties. One of the key ways of doing that is with the cross-link density. That's the number of physical bonds between polymer chains. And what that does is change its swelling behavior. You can see the water uptake as a function of cross-linking. As we introduce more and more cross-linking, we have less and less water present, so the material becomes more and more rigid. That allows us to tune the mechanical properties. We can also uh, change polymer type, which is going to depend or influence properties such as degradation, biocompatibility, and swelling activation. And then of course pore size is important for uh, elution properties. So this is an example of a hydrogel that we made that we introduced a, a gradient into it where we had high cross-linking on the upper end and very low cross-linking on the lower end. And what that results in is very low water content on the upper end, high water content on the lower end, and, and com commensurately high modulus and low modulus. So this would be a nice example of a material that may be very lubricious down here and compliant, whereas down here where you may want to anchor it to the bone, it's going to be much more rigid and, and uh, better mechanical properties. 
Hydrogels are very common in nature, which is why we try to mimic them synthetically. You can see the commonality uh, in structure for all of these. They have a, these are called, called polysaccharides, having this uh, common uh, ring-like structure here. And you can also see they all contain these OH groups. Those are hydroxyls, which are water-loving. The body loves uh, water when they have hydroxyls present. So. Uh, this is something we try to mimic in uh, synthetic hydrogels as well. And one of the most common ones, polyvinyl alcohol, has that very common OH group as well. And there are m multiple other types of hydrogels here. Polyethylene glycol is a very common one. And uh, two hydroxyethyl methacrylate, most contact lenses contain that, uh, HEMA. The body has a lot of hydrogels uh, present in there. You know, we're composed of 80 to 90 percent water. We're mostly hydrogel as well. Mucus and tear films are hydrogels. Cartilage, vitreous humor in the cornea, and uh, tendons are all examples of hydrogels. And these all use very similar chemicals. Collagen is the main co component of all of these, but obviously they have very different properties, and that comes down to the microstructure of these materials. That's uh, going to dictate if you have a hard, rigid material like cartilage or something that's jelly-like, like, like uh, the uh, vitreous humor in the eye. And uh, that gives you your different properties, of course. So that's something that we're trying to mimic in synthetic uh, implants. Uh, hydrogels are used primarily as either carriers or protectors in, in current types of medical devices. Coatings for stents and, and other uh, 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 ca uh, balloon catheters. It's lubriciousness and it also prevents biofouling. Also used for drug release and drug eluding sense. I mentioned how these materials can be responsive to the environment. Uh, these are what we call smart gels, which will have a response to pH or other uh, uh, targeted delivery systems. Uh, vision, uh, I mentioned they're used for uh, interocular lenses and contact lenses, HEMAs. Uh, the things I'm going to focus on today, tissue bulking and cartilage replacements are two main things that we and our company are interested in, others as well. So tissue bulking, one of the main applications is urinary incontinence, which uh, affects a lot of people and, and often results from uh, uh, pregnancy. And what happens is the, the sphincter around the bladder starts to become weakened during, during pregnancy. You lose muscle tone and the uh, urethra can't uh, fully, fully constrain uh, as necessary. Uh, there are surgical treatments, but one uh, approach that some people have been using, including us, is to try to inject a hydrogel into the muscle wall to reinforce it, gels in vivo, and then that provides enough tissue bulking effect that the natural muscle tissue that's still remaining can now adequately close the, the sphincter and uh, uh, take care of the uh, urinary incontinence problem. Uh, Gastroesophageal reflux disease, similar sort of approach uh, in, in injecting hydrogels in there. Another active project that we have is for uh, stroke mitigation. This is for patients that have had uh, myocardial infarction uh, due to a, a stroke event. And that, that, an MI is when part of the heart uh, tissue dies. Uh, and what can happen is when the uh, uh, mitral valve attempts to close during the natural uh, pulsatile action, the heart wall starts to bow out, and that, that results in an inadequate closure of the, the mitral valve, res resulting in blood flow back into the lungs and uh, regurgitation. Uh, what we discovered working with Mass General Hospital is if we injected our hy injectable hydrogels into the wall of the heart, that, that bulked up the tissue enough that they were, the heart was able to close, and we were able to reverse the MR, in the, this is a sheet model, uh, before injection, after injection, we were able to take care of the mitral valve regurgitation, all with just a needle stick into the heart. So it's a percutaneous injection, no major surgery required on this. So it's very encouraging. But what's uh, probably going to be interesting for most people here at the orthopedics conference is what can we do for soft tissue augmentation for large joints. This is really the gold standard that many people have been trying to work on for many years, including us. Uh, and the reason that there's really nothing on the market quite yet is that it's a really tough, tough uh, job uh, to, to get to this. Uh, what, what we're looking for is a nice, conformable, lubricious surface like the native cartilage, something that's going to lubricate, spread the, the load uh, uniformly, and have very low friction. Ideally, we have a, a, a treatment that's going to be minimally invasive, not quite percutaneous injections, but something close to that if possible, Biocom biomechanically compatible so that the uh, ligaments and meniscus, if they're removed, they, they're, we're, we're mimicking what they're supposed to be doing. All these things suggest that hydrogels may be a good uh, application area, primarily because cartilage is a type of hydrogel. 
And I just touch on a few approaches that folks are, are using, uh, and some of these are discussed uh, in ORS papers uh, coming up next week, so I encourage you to visit those. At Johns Hopkins and, and uh, published in Biomaterials, conjoined sulfate systems are, have been explored whereby uh, the, the native tissue is removed the chondroitin sulfate hydrogel is put in place along with native cartilage cells and eventually uh, the native cart cartilage tissue will grow in place. Polyethylene glycol sa scaffolds have also been used. These are hydrogel systems which then degrade over time, leaving behind native cartilage. The two on the right are, uh, represent synthetic uh, tissue replacements. Double hydrogel networks are trying to mimic what na native tissue really does, where you've got uh, a rapid creep compliance with a larger, larger network structure, and then as you, you, when you hit a certain degree of strain, the secondary structure tar starts to kick in and handles the, the, the low uh, creep range. Uh, and there's a couple of uh, papers on that uh, at ORS next week. An area that we've done a lot of work with in is uh, polyvinyl alcohols. Uh, and there, we, and along with others, have, have done a lot of work uh, to try to make PVA-based systems. PVA is a really nice system. It's very biocompatible, and there's a lot of implants out there that are, are, are uh, using PVAs. Uh, these are some examples of some mechanical testing that we've been doing on PVAs and what people need to be considering for uh, cartilage replacement technologies. Creep is one of the main issues. This is uh, deformation of the material under load. Uh, we really want something that does creep a little bit because that's dim dim uh, giving the cushioning effect and the, uh, the, the slight subsidence you get when you load a, a joint. But you only want so much creep before you, you want to plateau out. And uh, compressive strength couples with creep. Uh, we're interested in looking at the, the creep load recovery of, of these, these systems. Actually, I'm gonna, this shows a little bit better here. When a load is applied to uh, a cartilage replacement, we want to see a rapid rise in, in strain and then a much uh, slower plateau attainment. Once the load is, is released, we'd like to have this go all the way back down to zero. So in other words, full creep recovery, otherwise we're going to be getting shorter and shorter as the day goes on. Uh, we're, we're not quite there yet, obviously, and, and, uh, but we're, we're making uh, good strides in that direction. Uh, tear strength is also very important, important, particularly in the knee. The knee is a tough joint. It's under a lot of uh, uh, shear stress and, and tearing strength of hydrogels has been a limitation with a lot of these potential replacements. So tear strength is something that we have to consider. Swelling pressure is something uh, that uh, one of our clients was making a, 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 a mosaic plasty replacement, so just a focal defect plug replacement. They hadn't adequately taken that into account, how much swelling can occur with these hydrogels, and they were constantly popping out of the, the the knee joint when they start to imbibe the, the synovial fluid in the knee joint. So they, they, they now know to look at this. And of course, friction is very important. These are some examples of uh, some of the first hydrogels that we worked at for co measuring coefficient of friction. Uh, our, uh, our target is, is cartilage down here, cartilage against cartilage, very low COF. We've got a modified system now which is uh, approaching that very nicely. And where COF is important, uh, coefficient of friction is in wear behavior. So the lower the COF, typically you get much better uh, wear, wear behavior. And as I mentioned previously, the morphology of the hydrogels really dictate a lot of the mechanical properties. And so what we try to do is maximize the mechanical properties along with the release behavior, kind of iteratively changing the formulation as we move along. So we're, we and others aren't there yet for cartilage, but we're getting close. Uh, I'm going to skip through these here, but I want to touch on one thing where, where hydrogels are finding a lot of application, and that's in tissue models. And this is for functional design testing, biocompatibility assessment, and procedure training, and it's starting to make its way into regulatory testing as well. Uh, and tissue models, uh, synthetic tissue models, are replacing natural tissue models in a lot of cases. One, uh, cost and the, the ethics involved with animal testing, but more importantly, the duration of viability of, of these synthetic models is really good. You know, they can last indefinitely, whereas uh, natural tissue models they go bad after a couple days. Uh, and more importantly, the reproducibility of these synthetic models is very good. It, you know, the, the pig and the uh, 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 cow, you never know if one, how they decide to choose their, to live their life. So they, you know, there's gonna be a lot of variability in those, those models there. Uh, a lot of the synthetic tissue models are made out of polyurethanes and elastomers, which look good and in some respects can function okay, but they miss the soft tissue response. And that's where uh, we and others 
engineers are working with hydrogels to try to mimic natural tissues, soft tissues. So we've come up with fat models, skin models. This is an annulus fibrosis, which uh, mimics the uh, biaxial behavior of materials. This is about 80% water, by the way. Uh, aorta models, and uh, this is a multi-layer model we came up with. And one that we, we've been doing a lot of work with is uh, tissue models to mimic the cutting behavior of natural tissue, both mechanically, with RF and other features. These are uh, uh, fibroids, uterine fibroids, and we just got an order from our client for about a thousand of these. So they've been training their surgeons with, uh, to, with on their, their, their systems, and it, it's been working very well. So uh, just to summarize, hydrogels, uh, their be behavior comes from their, their uh, similarity to natural tissue, suitable for tissue models, replacements and for uh, the final implants. Uh, thank you for listening. We have a uh, booth at the ORS next week. Please come by and we can talk to you more about hydrogels. Uh, if you're interested in this, this is what happens when you shoot Silly Putty with a uh, 22 caliber bullet. Uh, and there's an application on our website that explains why Silly Putty's fun. So, thank you. On your, uh, on your injections, how, what is the, lo the long-term viability or the sustainability of these, hi of these hydrogels in the body? I know there's, there's, the body likes to reabsorb things. The body likes to do things with, art, with things that are injected into it. How long do these things really last in different environments? Most of the, the synthetic hydrogels will not degrade when they're placed in the body. There's no real known biological response that would result in their degradation. Uh, our, we, with our, uh, the MR uh, work that we're doing, the Mitchell valve regurgitation, we're about two years out now with, with the in vivo, and they're still viable at that point. So some of them will degrade, but most of them, like white fungus mold, is the only thing they'll go after PVA, for instance. So if you've got that, you've got other problems. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, in general, they, they 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 have it, it looks pretty good for their durability yeah.